Start. So my name is Clément Escoffier. I'm working at Red Hat in the Vertex team. And this talk should have been presented by Julien Viette, but uh, for personal reasons, he was unable to come here, so I will replace him. The slides are available to this URL here, and the demo I'm showing are uh, available to this URL here. So this talk is entitled The Reactive Cuisine. So in Reactive Cuisine, there is a reactive world, or buzzword, I would say. Reactive means showing, or reactive software is a software showing responses to stimuli. So you can say that since the early ages of computers, we are always built reactive system or reactive software because it's in the nature of software to obey to user input or operating system orders and stuff like that. And you're right. However, in the last few years, three clusters have emerged. One that is named reactive systems, which is an architectural style to build system, a distributed system right. By infusing asynchrony and asynchronous message pacing at the core of your system, you get resilience and elasticity, and it uh, allow you to get responsiveness. So that's more or less what you want to build, a system that will still be responsive when facing failures and in front uh, of fluctuating loads. To build such kind of things, you need an asynchronous development model. And one of them, probably one of the most popular ones today, is reactive programming. Reactive programming is an API that lets you compose uh, asynchronous and event-driven software by using data stream as a main construct. So you have data streams and you observe them. And inside the data streams, you can have three things, data, errors, or completion, meaning that your stream has completed. Um, data streams are an asynchronous data structure because you don't know when the data will arrive. So it's always, it's again a little bit about asynchronous. When you do data stream, you quickly have an issue. If you have a very fast producer, that sends a lot of data inside your stream, and a very slow consumer. Because what will happen is that you will start buffering all the events until you run out of memory, and your system will crash. So to avoid this, there is reactive streams, which is a protocol, a back pressure protocol, that allow asynchronous and non-blocking back pressure between fast producer and slow consumer. So your consumer is going to tell to the producer when he's ready to handle the load. Reactive streams specification looks very, very small and looks very simple. It's not. It's really very complicated to implement right. But the good news for you is that you don't care anymore because recent and modern reactive programming libraries such as Reactor or Eric Java 2 integrate reactive streams as back pressure protocol. So all those reactive highland were about um, Asynchrony. Um, asynchrony doesn't mean offloading the work onto a separate thread pool. If you do that, you are just limiting your scalability and you didn't get it. If you have threads, what happens if you have threads? Most of the time your thread is going to be stuck waiting for some response or some writes on your operating, uh, on your file disk and so on. So you are going to just use resources for nothing. When you use one thread per request, which is a traditional Java model, um, Java EE model, typically, if you need to handle 10,000 requests at the same time, you need 10,000 thread. What happens with 10,000 thread? Well, you don't have memory anymore on your laptop or on your computer because threads are very heavy in terms of memory, but there is a hidden side effect. It is also going to consume your CPU quota. If you run on the cloud or inside a container environment, Switching threads takes time. You say, yeah, but that's not been optimized for years. Yes, but we are speaking about 10,000 threads. So even optimized, it's going to take a lot of time. This time is not about executing your business logic. It's just about context switching. This is bad, very bad. So the asynchronous execution model give you another way to do that. Instead of writing your code in a synchronous manner, it's going to write your code in small chunks. And when a task cannot make progress anymore because of a IO, it will use non-blocking IO, and the thread, the same thread, will be able to make progress on another task. And when we get the response from this IO, like here, for example, for the task A, it will come back and will continue exec this execution. So to handle 10,000 requests with this model, we need one thread. This is actually what we do on a Raspberry Pi. So, however, there is 
There is a little bit of a price to pay here, because if it will be that simple, we will all do this. To build such kind of system using this asynchronous execution model, you need an asynchronous programming model, you need non-blocking I.O., and you need the task-based concurrency. And this is what Eclipse Vertex offers to you today. It's actually provide several programming models, a huge library for both non-blocking I.O. and an event loop-based task, uh, um, event loop-based concurrency. So Vertex is a toolkit, it's just a library. We are going to see that using a couple of demos that has been built to uh, let you implement distributed and reactive systems. It's been designed with reactive in mind since the first line of code. So it's not something that has been added as an afterthought. It's really something there. It provides several asynchronous development models, and these development models are not limited to Java. Because while well, we all have different backgrounds, we may have JavaScript users here, we may have Scala users, we may have Kotlin users, or Groovy. Vertex provides their API for all this language by using the construct of the language. So for Scala, we recommend to use Scala features because they are great and well implemented. For Kotlin, go for Coroutine. They are really the next level of uh, concurrency construct we are going to use in, soon in Java, in five years or 10, but it's really, very really nice and so on. As I said, the, concur the concurrency is simplified using an event loop. Why it's simplified? Because when you have an event loop, you're always executed by the same thread, so you don't need synchronized anymore because you can't have concurrent access if you have a single thread. Only one thing can be executed at a time. We have a huge ecosystem. We are going to see a little bit of that. We have a clustered event bus, and Vertex is used today for microservices, web app, IoT, API, gateway, high volume event processing, um, full-blown backend uh, message bus, and this is production usage. And how is that possible that a single toolkit is able to go from IoT to a financial system? Well, it's simple. It's all about freedom. It looks a little bit weird at the beginning when you start with Vertex, because Vertex won't tell you how to build your system. You have more knowledge about your business, about what you want to build, than we have. And actually, we would like to keep this that way. We don't want to know about all your application and how they're built. It's your responsibility. So yes, after years of servitude where you are following the rules given by frameworks, here it's a little bit different because you can really have a fresher and express your creativity. If you like Japanese style, you can build such kind of system. If you prefer modern, small house with swimming pool, go for it. Or if you prefer British manner where the Wi-Fi doesn't cross, the, the wall, no problem, you can build that. So you are really back in charge. It's really a big change for developers and architects. So let's see a little bit how it looks like. I will start with a very traditional use case of Vertex. It's a kind of an API gateway. So this API gateway is going to receive some HTTP request. And because some font new fancy law forced me to expose new APIs on top of my existing services, I need to implement these APIs, but obviously there is no one and one mapping. So I will first call the customer service, get some data out of that, and then I will call the balance service and the depth service, get all three responses, and send that back. Okay, so here is the code. So normally I live coding this code, but because this session is shorter, I will just go through and I will live code the second demo. Um, so this is a vertical. A vertical is just a Java class, because I, I decided to use Java. It seems to be the canonical language here. Um, I could have used Kotlin or whatever. Uh, so it's just a Java class that extends abstract vertical and that gives me access to the vertex object. It has a start method and also a stop method, but we don't care about the stop method. I should have used service discovery, but here I just inject in my three services, and then I write a router here. So this router is where I describe my HTTP API. So slash, slash name, slash post, and so on. I start my HTTP server, and so on. So what's interesting is what's happening in the retrieve method. So here, first, we have the reactive um, uh, approach that is shown here. Every time I got an event, which is an HTTP request on get, on get slash and a name, I'm going to call this handler. So it's reactive. It's react to the HTTP request. The retrieve method is first going to call the customer service using a web client, which is an HTTP client, asynchronous HTTP client for Vertex. And look at this type here. It's written a single. 
singular and weird because it's a data stream, so it's reactive programming, but a data stream that can contain only one element. Basically, it's like a futures, but modeled on a data stream. Um, then, when I have the result of this call here, I extract the response as a JSON object, and I extract the account. So this will be my first uh, request. Nothing happened at that time. Data streams are lazy. Until we do this call here, nothing is going to happen. So once I have the result, I want to compose that with two calls, one to my balance service and one to my debt service. This is what is done here. So it's the same code except that now I get double from uh, the JSON response. And then I need to have all the three responses and build a new JSON object. This is done by the zip operator. Zip operator, it's a zip, so it's going to associate items from different data stream. When they are single, so having only one value, it will just associate the result of my two operation. So it's what I have here. This is my first single, so my call to balance. This is my second single my call to depth, this is my two result, and then I compute my result out of this. And here is what I say. If you don't subscribe, and believe me, the first time you are going to use reactive programming, you are going to miss this line here. And don't forget about it. If you forget this, nothing is going to happen. It's lazy. Basically, you have described all your logic, but you forget to tell, oh, actually, I'm actually interested for you to run. So if you don't tell that, it does nothing. It's vacation time. So. Here I subscribe, so there is several flavor and variants of the subscribe method, uh, method, but here I have the results, the errors, and I just uh, write the HTTP response out of that. So I'm going to run this. See, so look, it's a library. It's not a framework. So I just have a main method with I instantiate vertex and I deploy my vertical. I will just right click, run, and it should be started. Yep, it is. So if I go there and I want to have the status of my bank account, there it is. So what we see here is that the result where I got the account service that has been called, get back, then the debt service has been called and balance service has been called at the same time, because we can use parallelization here, and the result has been sent here. So what's the point of doing that using reactive? Well, if you use an API, if you want to build an API gateway, it's a front end. It's what your users are facing. And you may have lots of users, really a lot. It's also something where anything that goes wrong inside your IT, anything, it will be shown here, inside your API gateway. A database gets done, that will be shown here. So this code needs to be very scalable and very resilient. That's exactly what a reactive system is made for. We will still be responsive when facing failures and unfluctuating load, and that's what we want. So let me stop this and go back to the slide for the second demo. So the second demo is a little bit more tricky. Uh, there is a lot of talk about IoT uh, here. Um, it's an IoT-like demo, uh, but uh, I don't have devices, so I'm using fake sensors. I'm going to use fake sensors using MQTT, the Vertex MQTT client. That will be sent using MQTT to a Vertex MQTT server, some data, randomly generated. Then inside this uh, component here, I'm going to get this data, do uh, or not really a lot of processing, but I want to write that to Kafka, because today everybody is using Kafka, so why not? And then once it's written in Kafka, we'll have this second component here that will read it from Kafka, computer average, send that to the Vertex event bus. And then the Vertex event bus is going to send that to a WebSocket, and you will see a nice graph. Well, a graph. I'm not a UI guy, so it's going to be an ugly graph. So let's do that. So this one I'm going to live code a lot more. So this is my main, where I have all my verticals. They could have been distributed over my network, but here I just have my laptop, so let's all deploy here. That's the sensors, nothing very interesting, except that this is the kind of data I'm going to generate. And let's start developing things. So I need MQTT server, MQTT server. Yes, this one. 
Okay, now I have an QTT server. It needs to start. So I need to call the listen method. Um, I need to report when it's done to Vertex, so Vertex knows that the uh, server has been started. So I do that with two completable and subscribe, to server and the future object. The future object comes from the, this one here, and it's just there to tell to Vertex when you're done initializing your vertical, because it's asynchronous. The method will end way before the server is started. So the method returns way before this. So you need to tell, you need to have a way to tell when you have completely initialized that, uh, to say to Vertex that, hey, I'm done, you can go ahead. So obviously it does nothing right now. So you need to have something called a handpoint handler. So an endpoint is more or less a communication between the client and the server, the MQTT client and the server, and it gets a payload. Uh, no, first I need to do accept. I don't know why we have this uh, boolean here, but it's MQTT stuff. Um, and when I have my communication, I need to register a handler, and this handler will receive the message sent by my client. So, and this message contains a payload. So let's get that one, and let's see if it works. Object.encode pretty. So now I just want to be sure that I've stopped everything. Okay, okay, I go to my main class, right click, run, and we should start seeing data emitted by my sensors that will be displayed here. Here we have the data, the stupid UID and the data that is randomly generated. Okay, it works. But I say I want to write that to Kafka. I will remove this. Kafka, you need to have a record. So I've prepared a small method which is here create record where I pass the UID. So this part here, and then I will just pass the JSON object. Object. So that's my record. And then I will just write that to my stream. Done. The record also contains the topics on which you are writing. And this topics is actually, I think it's believe it's data. There we go. So now it's written to Kafka, so we need to read it. Let's read it on the other side, uh, here. So I read it using a Kafka consumer, and I extract it as a stream of data. This stream will get all the data, so it's really a multi-element stream. I extract the value, I don't care about the, the, the key, so uh, from my record, and now I want to extract from this, uh, the data, so this. So I have my integer. No, I want to compute the average over the last five values. Why not? Window five. This is going to create five value, collect five value, and then send to another stream this buffer of five values. So then I want to compute the average of that. Average double. So now I have doubles, which are the average of the data that has been sent to Kafka, and this data come from my sensors that were using MQTT. And now I will subscribe, because if you don't subscribe, nothing is going to happen. And when I have my average, average, I'm going to send that to the vertex event bus. And to the average address. There we go. And no, here, and done. Then we have here, uh, Web. web vertical. The web vertical is actually using something called the SOCGS handler, which is SOCGS bridge. It's going to receive the data from this average uh, address from the event bus and transfer that using SOCGS. So SOCGS is kind of weird because it's a not that famous JavaScript library that is more, more than six months old, which for a JavaScript library is amazing. It's close to be retired, uh, but it works very, very well. And what it is doing is that it's going to negotiate the protocol between the server and the client, here, uh, Google Chrome. And this negotiation is going to start to say, oh, do you support WebSocket? Yes, okay, let's use WebSocket. And then it will degrade to SSC, and even if you are using Internet Explorer 6, which I hope you're not, it will still work uh, using iframes, but I really hope you are not using this. 
security will be a small issue here. So this is what is done here, and let's see if it works. Okay. So now I need to remember. There we go. I told you it's going to be an ugly shot. Yes. So every, well, the sensor is sending one data every five seconds. So to get five data, I need to wait five seconds, which is not really great, but it works. So the data you see here come from my MQTT sensor to my custom MQTT server that send to Kafka and consume from my other component from Kafka, compute the average, send to the event bus, then send to a web socket and display as a blue line. All this for a blue line. But we want something a little bit smoother. So let's start and look at here. Here for the sensor, I'm just deploying one. Let's deploy yeah, five. So what Vertex is doing here is I say Vertex is using a single thread. I lied a little bit. It's not going to use a single thread. It's going to use as many threads as CPU core you have. But once you are assigned to one thread, you will never be accessed by any other thread. So basically, it can scale uh, very well based on the number of core you have on your operating system, uh, on your laptop, or on your so server. It's very, very interesting to have this because if I start like that, up, no, I will have five sensors that will send data every one second. So that means that all this data will go through all my pipelines. And now, if I refresh here, I should have a way smoother experience because we have way more data. So how does that work? How does it uh, collect the number of CPU core and so on? Well, um, every vertical will be assigned to an event loop and every event loop is going to be assigned to a CPU core. So obviously if you have more verticals than the number of CPU cores that are available, then the same core is going to use for two things. So you need to control that. Obviously we have configuration for this. Oh, no, I have dots. I told you, I'm really bad at UI. Um, it's nice with dots, almost. The dots appear before the, the lines, which is weird. Okay. Um, but, so, um, and that way, you can really use the full performance of your system, all the CPUs, and not having just one CPU. Oh, yeah. How many threads are running here? Well, it's pretty simple. I will just compute the number of vertical I have. One, two, three, plus five. Eight thread. Eight thread. No thread pool, nothing. Context switch will be very, very fast when you have eight threads. And the memory consumed, almost nothing. And you can handle a lot of loads that way. Really a lot. So that was part of the demo. We only covered the first percent of the Vertex ecosystem. The Vertex ecosystem has been uh, thrilling over the last few years. We got more than 10,000 contributors. And we can do microservices. So microservices, we have service discovery, we have um, circuit breaker, our own. We are not using Istrix. We can work with Istrix, but we have our own completely asynchronous circuit breaker, L checks, and uh, configuration support. We can integrate with almost anything like RabbitMQ, MQP 1.0, MQTT, we have seen that, Storm, Kafka, we have seen that, and Apache Camel for everything else that is not supported here. Apache Camel, uh, there is, uh, yeah, this morning, um, Aurelien show uh, Apache Camel. It's an integration library that are more than 100 connectors. So basically, you have a system, it interacts with that one. In terms of network, uh, it supports HTTP, HTTP2, GRPC, the new core bar. Uh, service proxies, which is a different way to do RPC uh, before gRPC really uh, ramp up. Uh, TCP, UDP, DNS, and so on. You are more on the upside. We provide large number of metrics, a shell to interact with your Vertex uh, application, so you can check and introspect it. Uh, you can access it using Telnet and SSH. Don't use Telnet in production, please. Um, but some people do. Um, Docker support. Vertex is Docker native. Because it uses very low limited memory and uh, CPUs, it works very, very well in a container. Because there is a couple of things that we don't know about containers. What happens if your container is using too much memory? Do you know? It's killed. End of the story. Period. 
That's great, except that maybe it's some very sensible data and you don't want to lose it. So you may be better check when you do containers. Uh, we support console, and obviously I'm working at Red Hat, so everything is Kubernetes. So uh, Kubernetes. So we have Kubernetes config, Kubernetes service discovery, and so on. We have the event bus, we saw that, and a couple of bridge, we have so, seen SOCGS, we have TCP, and we even have clients for different language like Python, Go, C++, C, and a couple of other language. Access to data, GDBC. Of course we have to support GDBC. We all have a GDBC database. Those, the only issue with JDBC is that JDBC is by default, by spec, blocking. And I said, if you have an event loop, you can't block, because blocking is just back to the thread model, and you don't want this. So we have developed our own asynchronous MySQL and PostgreSQL driver, a completely reactive uh, PostgreSQL driver. And if you look at the Tech Emperor benchmark, the results have been published last week, we are first in terms of data. So we all perform everyone because we have this uh, uh, reactive uh, uh, PostgreSQL um, uh, client. This benchmark is not run by us. It's run by some other third party entities that take care of this. So we can't say that we optimize or we shit and so on. No, they run it on their own machine. Uh, we obviously support Redis, Mongo, authentication, security, and so on. So just to summarize it, reactive is about asynchrony. In the 80s, we have considered that asynchronous programming was a bit too hard for Lambda developers, and we start lying. We start building a broken abstraction using blocking I.O. While it's taking a lot of time, and time is resources. So reactive is an approach to fix this. What you want to build is reactive systems, distributed systems done right that are responsive in face of failure and even under fluctuating load. For this, you may need back pressure, and reactive streams will provide this, and you need an asynchronous development model, and reactive programming is one of them. Why Vertex? Because it's all in one bundle. It's very, very small. If you do a fat jar with Vertex, if you exit 10 megabytes, it starts to be a very big application, because it has almost no dependency on, except Netty and Jackson. Um, you can build reactive systems, it has been built for that. We support reactive streams, we support reactive programming using Eric Javatu. That's all I have. If you are more int interested by this, there is this free ebook here that you can download for free. Um, it's short, I wrote it, so believe me, I'm lazy, so it's only 70 pages. Um, uh, you can contact me at this address here um, or on Twitter. Um, I will do an Ignite talk about reactive later today. I don't know, uh, later today, check the agenda. And I have two other talks tomorrow about different parts of Reactive. I do one live coding session about Kubernetes, where it's all about code. So if you love code and you want to see how we deployed Reactive system on top of Kubernetes with Docker container and so on, don't miss it. And if you are more a data guy and you want to know, hey, how do I manage data in such kind of new world, then I have an event sourcing and CQRS uh, session tomorrow afternoon, check the agenda. Um, I need to check it to be sure to be on time. Uh, but yeah. Thank you. If you have any question, we still have one minute. <laughs> it's going to be a short question. And don't forget, if you're interested by the code that I just shown or the slides, here are the two URLs. You can reuse them. So ECF 18 dash reactive cuisine and Cisco various vertex demo. I, I continue contributing to, to this repository, so maybe you will see more demos coming in the next few months. Thank you. And there is vertex sticker over there. They are pretty nice on the fridge. On laptop.